that's being made um, in our catchment area of Connecticut in regards to cancer screening and many other initiatives. So Beth's going to discuss some of that. Okay, thanks, Melinda. Um, can you all hear me? Yes. All right, speak up if you can't. Um, and I'm. I was just looking. I'm going to be looking at my clock at my telephone just to see the time occasionally. So as Melinda said, I'm going to be talking about um, the Smiler Screening and Prevention Program today and um, in particular just sort of focusing on cancer disparities. Um, so just two things. We're going to, I'm going to do sort of a high, uh, we'll talk about the program itself and then kind of a high level view of uh, sort of the modalities that we use here for screening and then how these disparities play out across them. So the Smilo Screening and Prevention Program started about three years ago, um, and the mission was it actually, this was Dr. Rogerio Lillenbaum's um, initiative with working with people from CPC, from the Connecticut, um, from Cancer Prevention and Control at the Yale Cancer Center, and other um, uh, physician leaders um, within the Cancer Center, deciding to start this program with the mission to promote cancer prevention and early detection through an evidence-based, personalized, and multidisciplinary approach. Um, I was the inaugural uh, program director and started, as I said, about three years ago. And then recently, um, we have expanded our team, as in February, and Dr. Xavier Yor is joining us as our medical director. And this is affording us an opportunity to really think about how to grow this program in new directions. In addition, we've been joined by a, a um, project coordinator who's dedicated to our staff, Andrea Kliss. So that will also, you will meet both of them as we go along, and you'll be uh, seeing more of us, I think, in the community. So we have a number of priorities. Um, the first was just to streamline access to the screening programs. There's always been a robust screening program here associated with the Cancer Center and with SMILO um, and with uh, Yale Health, but we really were looking for an opportunity to just kind of streamline the access both for patients and for providers. We also wanted to sort of standardize the education and the outreach activities. Um, in particular, you'll see that there's a lot of, there's always been controversy around screening guidelines, and so we were looking to standardize that somewhat. Um, we wanted to also grow our screened population, and by that I'm really referring to, it's, it's great to get the people who've never been screened to walk through the door and get a first screening, but the real benefit from screening comes from, you know, following adherence to guidelines and following those guidelines over time. That affords the best opportunity for early detection and then um, finding cancers when they're more treatable. And then the last thing that I want to talk about, and it's actually the focus today, is on this issue. Um, we really, from the start, made it a point to address the needs of our underserved populations. Of course, ultimately, the goal here is that we will find all of these cancers at an earlier stage when they're more treatable, and we'll do that for a broader segment of the population. So in terms of our catchment population, Melinda alluded to it. Um, part of the cancer center uh, the renewal process actually now includes a very robust community outreach and engagement program, and, and our goal and our mission is really to address the cancer needs within our catchment population. And the catchment population for the, for, this, for the cancer center, the Yale Cancer Center, is the entire state of Connecticut. Sometimes the catchment populations in a larger state are just a portion of the state, but here it's the entire state. So who lives here? Well, about 70% of the population are white. That's that um, bar on the far left, and um, a little less than 10% are people who self-report as African American, a little less than 15% are Hispanic Latino, and overall, uh, statewide, we're a fairly affluent state, about a little few, fewer than 11% of the population uh, live below the federal poverty level. So these are the data for the city of New Haven. And in contrast, the city of New Haven is actually a minority majority city. So about 60% of our population are either Hispanic, Latino, or African American. And the, far, the bar on the far right shows you that more than a quarter of our local population live below the federal poverty level. So the federal poverty level for a family of four is about $24,000. It's a pretty low, low uh, bar. Um, and unfortunately, this is not unique to the city of New Haven. This is what all of the urban areas pretty much throughout the state look like. So uh, it's kind of a result of historical residential segregation with all of the, um, the lower socioeconomic groups and uh, minorities being concentrated in our urban areas. 
So this has been our charge as we um, moved forward in thinking about how to pri make, set priorities for the screening program. But of course, the other thing we look at is um, the cancer burden. So just to um, show you, this is for the, the state of Connecticut. The, the states in red are the, in the highest quintile of cancer incidence. That includes the state of Connecticut. And in fact, the incidence rates, these are incidence rates, are about 7.5% higher for um, whites. And actually, they're close to that for the total po population, just because whites are dominant. Um, and about actually 4% lower for our African American Americans living in Connecticut compared to African Americans living outside of the state. And we have the dubious distinction of coming in first in the United States for incidents in Hispanic Latinos, with the incidence rates here being about 35% higher than they are in other states. Um, so the good news is we do much better in terms of cancer mortality. The, the rates are lower than they are nationally. That's true for both whites and for his, and uh, African Americans. They're about the same for Hispanic Latinos. The worrisome thing there is that when you look at the trends, uh, they're actually trending upwards for Hispanic Latinos, which you'd expect because the incidence rates are increasing as well. Uh, so the cancers that are, these are death rates. These are national data from the American Cancer Society. And as you probably all know, the primary um, cancer that, is the, that drives the uh, mortality rates is lung. Um, for both men and women, and then for women, the second is breast, and then followed by colorectal. And for men, it's lung, colorectal, and then prostate cancer. So it probably makes perfect sense to you, as it does to us, that these are the, these are the cancers that we focus on in terms of screening. Um, not only are, does that reflect our cancer burden, not only nationally, but also here in the state of Connecticut, but also for each of these cancers, there's evidence that um, suggests that um, screening actually does result in a reduced cancer mortality. And there's also recommended screening guidelines, and some of these, of course, are um, under the Affordable Care Act. Uh, the, these are covered by insurance as well. We do actually, and uh, tying into uh, the recent talk, we also have a very robust program here locally, which is driven mostly by the physicians and the different disease teams um, for head and neck cancers and skin cancers. We do a number of free screening events. And then also because even though cervical cancer is not um, increasing here in Connecticut, it does um, impact Hispanic Latinos more than other groups. And there's also the opportunity, of course, uh, with a very effective screening tool, pap smears, um, and, it's, and also uh, because of the opportunity to use vaccination. So we are also targeting these cancers as well in some of our programs. Uh, the Smilo Screening and Prevention Program, this is our team out on the New Haven Green one day. This is um, within an inflatable colon. Uh, the fellow with the sunglasses is Jose de Jesus. He was our lone community health educator until, uh, well, actually, she comes about a week from now. We have a new community health educator who will be joining our team. Um, We've had a number of accomplishments, and he joined us in 2016. Since then, we've documented outreach to more than 6,500 individuals. Um, that's sort of face-to-face -face sort of uh, outreach and education. We, one of our priorities has been to increase lung cancer screening, and we've um, seen an increase in 60% since we started to, um, to roll out the program and to target this. Uh, over the course of two years, we've two and a half years, uh, we have actually provided free screening events, and this is actually really driven by most of the, the clinicians, many of you are here, um, to provide free screening rates and then targeting like fif almost 1,500 individuals. Um, last year we spent, and this picture is from this event, we were part of the NCI's program. It's a colorectal cancer screening initiative called the Screen to Save program. And we were required to have a number of events and intervention. There was also a science, a research piece attached to this. Uh, so we spent a lot of energy doing that. And then I think most importantly, and I think it was part of this vision of creating a program, not just allowing screening to kind of continue to occur in a haphazard way, but having a program really has given us a platform to lead the discussion um, both locally and also kind of statewide around cancer screening. And we've had, in 2016, we had a screening summit um, at the West Campus, and then this past year, uh, as part of the Connecticut Cancer um, Partnership, many of our, our physician leaders joined us and we um, presented most of that morning program talking about screening guidelines as well as shared decision making. So the program's been busy. 
um, looking forward in this next year, um, now that Dr. Yor is on the team, we are really looking to develop a colorectal cancer screening program. We've always had colorectal screening, but it hasn't been part of a program. Um, we're going to continue to promote our lung cancer screening, and there's a wonderful program here um, that Lynn Tanui runs, and I'll say a bit more about that. And then also the, the immediate goal is to begin to expand these to our clinical care centers. As you know, the Yale Cancer Center has about 12 cancer centers. So uh, little by little, we are, we are expanding first, probably starting with Bridgeport and L&M and some others. So at this point, um, I'm just going to switch gears and talk about cancer screening and um, a very high-level approach to what the guidelines are, but thinking about that through the lens of cancer disparities. So with colorectal cancer screening, um, the program that we are going to be building, actually Dr. Yor is taking um, the lead on this, and I, I expect once we're further along, uh, he'd be a great, um, it would be really wonderful to have him here doing a grand rounds about it. But as you know, many of the guidelines, the official guidelines, um, come out of the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force. So they recommend right now colorectal screening for individuals um, 50 until the age of 75. And there's a number of ways to do this. One is colonoscopy. Others are um, using fit kits and uh, sigmoidoscopy, which is not widely used in Connecticut. Um, and the, the risks and benefits basically over time are considered to be pretty uh, equitable. But that's a little bit more nuanced than that. Yes, they are. Oh, excuse me. Oh, I went way to the end, didn't I? All right, let me back it up. I'll try to scoot, scooch over some of these so you won't be. Don't worry about the number of slides. Um, so one of the issues when we look at our local population, actually the state of Connecticut, there are different um, benchmarks. And Healthy People 2020 um, has a benchmark which we meet the state of Connecticut meets in terms of cancer screening. So the bar on the far left is for the entire population, and the one next to it, the taller one, is for whites. And we meet the benchmark, which is about 70.6% of people screened currently. These are based on um, uh, survey data. So there may be some issues about who actually reports to those data as well. Where we haven't hit the benchmark is for African Americans and whites, the two green um, columns here. So this is where, uh, excuse me, African Americans and Hispanic Latinos. So this is where we are really focusing these efforts going forward. Uh, so the question again comes back to, in Connecticut, people are either advocating for colonoscopy or fit, fit tests. Uh, at a national level, the NCI is behind it, the American Cancer Society um, have really moved away from advocating simply for colonoscopy, but to offer one or the other. The idea is that there are many people, particularly minorities um, nationwide, who are not, taking, not receiving colonoscopy screening, and sometimes due to concerns about um, anesthesia or different reasons, um, they are less likely to get colonoscopy, so the idea is that we have this other Tests, fit tests are, these are uh, stool sample tests that can be done in the home. And there are recent data showing that fit tests actually, if done regularly over a 10 year period, um, are as beneficial as a colonoscopy. The difference is one can have a colonoscopy every 10 years and sort of be done with it. So the, the question here, I think, and I always feel like as a person who focuses on cancer disparities, I'm sort of the wet blanket in the room. I think this is a great idea. The sort of thinking is any test is better than no test. Um, but one possibility is that systematically um, people of color or under, under or people with less access will be um, given fit tests instead of colonoscopies. And the problem with that is that these fit kits, they're almost their equivalent as long as they're done regularly on time every year for 10 years. That's a pretty high bar to meet for all kinds of patients. So um, I think it just behooves us to keep this in mind, and particularly, you know, we hear a lot about implicit biases. What we have to be careful of is so much of the decision making now is now relegated to shared decision making between a patient and their provider. And I think it's pretty uh, incumbent upon the providers to be, in, to be careful not to, um, to allow their biases about what a patient, whether a patient may or may not do the prep properly, um, influence that conversation. So those are one of the things that we really are looking at as we move forward. <coughs> 
So let me switch for a minute and talk about lung cancer screening. So uh, lung cancer screening, there are pockets throughout Connecticut where we have high lung cancer screening rates, and one of them is here in, in uh, New Haven. Our rates in New Haven are actually 12% higher than they are for the U.S. and also um, higher than they are for Connecticut. They're higher in whites, a little bit um, higher in blacks. They're quite a bit higher, about 63% higher in uh, Hispanic and Latinos. And it probably is no surprise that we also see smoking rates that are a bit higher in uh, the city of New Haven than they are in the rest of the state, particularly in our low-income neighborhoods. So one of the major breakthroughs in cancer screening is um, a, a very successful lung cancer screening tool. Um, beginning in about 2011, we had clinical trial data showing that with um, LDCT, these low-dose um, CAT scans, we can pick up, we can actually uh, uh, reduce cancer, lung cancer mortality by about 20%. Uh, this, as you know, is huge because otherwise uh, only those people who had sort of incidental findings of lung cancer were diagnosed at um, earlier stages. So one of the challenges just in the rollout, so there's always a big difference between clinical trial data and actual implementation. So part of the challenge, and this is not just here, but nationwide, has been that doctors, it's really underutilized. Doctors tend not to be, uh, are not uh, ordering these tests as often as they should, and patients aren't requesting it. And one of the other issues is that the clinical trial had a very, um, uh, it was a very strong uh, smoking history having to do with it. it had to be 30 pack years or more. That's what the guidelines now call for. Um, and there are some analyses that have been done si since that actually suggest that even those people who have 20 to 29 year smoking history actually would benefit as well. So the problem in terms of um, disparities is that smoking patterns are different across different racial ethnic groups. And in fact, um, often African Americans in particular do not qualify for s screening as it is now because they don't meet the 30-pack year history. Excuse me. And yet we do know that um, with less tobacco exposure, African Americans are actually more likely to be diagnosed with lung cancer. So this is one of these very nuanced sort of aspects of lung cancer screening that um, is being discussed, at least in the disparities world. Another issue is that the, this is not a screening test. Linton Neuwiener Group sort of bravely, the first time they rolled it out, um, looked at, uh, they had a free screening event, which was very well attended. They did about 100 free screenings. The problem was most of the folks showing up did not have primary care providers. And as you can imagine, when you were scanning the whole upper part of the body, they were finding all kinds of things which were not even cancer related. Some were, you know, required a cardiologist to get involved. So it was sort of um, quite problematic in that sense. So we've learned over time that it's really a requirement that somebody have a primary care provider um, lined up when they present for screening. And then finally, um, they're, they're in this trial, as in almost all clinical trials that inform our screening recommendations, there were very few people of color. So I'm just going to say quickly, I'm not going to talk a lot about prostate cancer in part because it's controversial, but um, just to remind you that prostate cancer, uh, as you know, that there was the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force for a very long time uh, did not recognize any did not recommend any screening for prostate cancer. Uh, that has been recently turned around again. They are now sort of kind of lukewarmly endorsing lung cancer screening for some groups, but in the context of shared decision making. Basically saying for men between the ages of 50 and 69, they should at least be exposed. You know, the doctor should feel free to bring up the topic with them, discuss it, put a lot of emphasis on shared decision making. The reason there was a lot of pushback about this has to do with this graph. As you can see, the African-American uh, incidence rates are um, uh, much higher than they are for other groups, as well as um, the mortality rates. So it def and, and the other thing that the, um, uh, recently the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force did, they've now included language recognizing that African-Americans are at higher risk than other groups. It turns out we're also seeing a similar pattern for Hispanic Latinos. So this is one of these, um, again, bringing a kind of a disparities um, uh, perspective to these conversations. We are starting to get the idea that one size doesn't fit all, as well as it really puts an awful lot of um, uh, uh, 
responsibility on the shoulders of the primary care providers who are having these, engaging these patients in decisions around screening. So briefly, I'm just going to finish up by talking a little bit about breast cancer. And breast cancer, we see similarly different kinds of patterns across um, uh, different racial ethnic groups. Uh, as you, I'm sure, are all aware, for breast cancer, although the incidence rates are higher in whites, they are, uh, the mortality rates are higher for African Americans. And a lot that has to do with later stage. So whereas about 62% of whites are diagnosed at an early stage or localized stage, um, that's only about 53% for African Americans. And Hispanic Latinos are somewhere between the two. Uh, so these controversies around screening are legendary in the case of breast cancer. Uh, but recently, the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force um, has recommended biennial screening in women between the ages of 50 and 74. And really, uh, grade C means they are not uh, strongly endorsing screening in uh, women in their 40s. There's been a lot of pushback from other groups. And in our case, we have, you know, part of the pushback is really that these are all based on the old clinical trials, which are now 40 years old. They included very few people of color, women of color. And the technology in those trials was very different than it is today. So the risk-benefit ratio is a little bit different than you'd expect. And then finally, the other uh, issue, as you know, is that African Americans and Hispanic Latinos tend to be diagnosed with more aggressive tumors and at earlier stages. So that when we delay screening until a later age, we are missing um, proportion, disproportionately cancers occurring in these groups. This is uh, my colleague, Lisa Newman, um, included this graph in um, a paper that she put out just sort of looking at this issue. And here you can see that the, um, these are the triple negative breast cancer rates in African Americans, as you'd expect, are in black and in whites, they're in white. Um, as you'd expect, across all age groups, the rates are higher in African Americans. Her point was that when you look at the, uh, for women in their 40s for whom we are just um, in a very lukewarm fashion, sort of advocating for screening, those his, the triple negative breast cancer rates are quite high in African Americans. And in fact, they're similar to what they are for white women at ages 60 to 74. So if we sort of take the position that we're going to start screening at age 50, there's an awful lot of African American women with fast growing tumors um, that are occurring at a younger age who will be sort of left out of the screening. So, I'm just looking at my lunch. Um, I just want to say briefly, there are an awful lot of other factors we know from our own research done here in Connecticut. Other factors impact the actual kind of real world efficacy of screening. These were studies um, from some years ago where we looked at differences between African Americans and whites. And as I said earlier, adherence to guidelines is where you get the benefit. What we saw was that there were race differences in adherence, they were actually adherence to guidelines done, measured prospectively, um, was low across both, both groups. Um, but what we saw, which is particular concern, is that when there is an abnormal finding, we documented that African American women were three and a half times less likely to get follow up. So while we have screening guidelines and we are implementing them, um, what we really need to do if we want to pay attention to the disparities issue is continue to. Cons to concern ourselves with sort of the follow-up, um, looking at these sort of more nuanced questions about screening, what the real world sort of efficacy and implementation is like. So uh, just to summarize, we are, as part of the program, we're looking at screening of the four major um, cancers that I mentioned. And that is certainly critical. It's a critical cancer control tool. Uh, the screening guidelines in general, the reason I know the public gets frustrated, physicians get frustrated because uh, these are constantly in flux, and in fact, even something as the new studies showing that um, we may be able to, one of the concerns around screening has always been that we are over-treating, well, with now the new study showing that um, a, a very large numbers of women may be able to forego chemotherapy. Um, studies like this emerge, and they always make us come back to screening and think about um, whether or not we need to um, revisit the screening guidelines in place to make sure that they aren't, um, that they were appropriate in those, in the context of new science. And then finally, we really need to consider the catchment area population and what the needs are. Um, so that just this, again, this one size fits all for screening 
doesn't really address the needs for, at least in Connecticut and many places, um, the population which is underserved. So I just want to send uh, a thank you to, as I said, it's a big a team effort. We have, um, we really are dependent upon the physician advisors, our, our physician champions, and um, leaders Melinda Irwin has helped serve as a, an advisor for the, um, representing the Yale Cancer Center on our team. Um, and a real um, thanks to Dr. Lillenbaum who started this program and has been instrumental in keeping it going. So thank you very much.